just really seems like the disciples aren't even paying attention, doesn't it, at this point? I mean, they, it's like they can't even see themselves, like they, they can't see the irony of this situation. Here's Jesus teaching about his own suffering and death, and then there's them arguing about which one of them is the greatest. There's a good reason why the lectionary gives us this story back to back with the one we had last week, the story of Jesus confessing, or excuse me, Peter confessing Jesus as the Messiah and then getting chewed out uh, for setting his mind not on divine things, but on human things. Mark wants us to see that irony. He wants us to see the obvious dissonance that the disciples are arguing about something so inane in the context of Jesus' prediction of his own passion. But there is a little bit of context we're missing here, because although the lectionary gives us these stories back to back, Mark has a couple stories in between. First, immediately following last week's story, is the story of the transfiguration. And if you remember that one, Jesus takes three of 12 disciples, Peter and James and John, and goes up the mountain where they see him transfigured with Moses and Elijah, <clears throat> the great lawgiver and the great prophet, right? The rest of the disciples, of course, are left behind. Well, while he was gone, those disciples, the other nine, tried to heal a boy possessed with a demon. And that second story occurs when Jesus and his three star pupils come down the mountain and, are ha and have to finish the job that they couldn't do. And they're forced to ask Jesus, why were we unable to cast it out? And so, in these two stories in between, we begin to see a hierarchy being set up, right? Jesus has his favorites and his failures. And so, is it really any wonder how they got on the topic of who was better than whom? <laughs> but even in that context, it's ironic. It's bookended by these two passion predictions. In telling these stories in this order, I think Mark wants us to identify with them a little bit, to help to make ourselves put ourselves in their shoes and recognize the little ways that we do this too. So we might recognize that same irony in ourselves. It might make us a little bit uncomfortable to hear it put so plainly, but if you think about it, this arguing about who is the greatest, it's something that we all kind of do, isn't it, in different ways? I mean, we do it not really with arguments or words, but we do it with our clothes and with our cars and our houses and our school districts. We do it with the food we choose to serve our guests or the way we present ourselves in public. We do it in a formal way in the way that we evaluate one another in our schools and our workplaces, right? Some students are just a higher grade than others. Some workers are worth more than others. But Jesus' response to this argument, of course, is to flip the criterion for greatness. <clears throat> the disciples are trying to climb the social ladder. So he takes somebody from the bottom of the ladder, a child who has no status to give or confer, and he puts them at the top. This is, as James says, the wisdom from above that's counter to the wisdom of the world. If you want to be greatest, be least. If you want to welcome God, welcome the lowliest child. And you know what? That's a pretty good lesson to take from all this. If you get nothing from this text besides treat lowly people like great people, I think that's just fine. I think we could all use an excuse in our lives to take a moment and think about who do we treat how and why, right? Um, who do we disregard or ignore or think less of? And maybe take a moment to think about seeing Jesus in those people. But as I think of this story, I wonder if that's all we can get from it. Yes, it, I think it can help us recognize those worldly passions for success that are warring with the passions for things like justice and peace and equity and the disputes that those things cause. But I also kind of think that just flipping the ladder upside down still just encourages us to climb the ladder, right? Just in the opposite direction. It's still a hierarchy. As I read this story, I'm more interested in what it can teach us about Jesus. 
I notice in this story that it's the disciples who are arguing about who is the greatest, who's highest in the pecking order. And at the top of that order is where we typically place God, right? In that context, it only makes sense to try to climb the ladder, whether up or down, because we're trying to get closer to where God is. <clears throat> and it just so happens that then we can sort of compare ourselves to the other people who are on the ladder with us. Are we higher or lower, and is that good or bad? When Jesus points to that child, the person at the bottom of the ladder, and he says that's where he is, where God is, I don't think he's just inviting us to reverse the direction that we're headed. Scholar Eugene Boring writes, giving things up will not make one Christian. It will only make one empty. What is difficult for our culture to understand, indeed what it cannot understand on its own terms, is, that, <clears throat> is an orientation to one's life that is not focused on self at all either as self-esteem or as self-abasement, as self-fulfillment self or self-emptying. We get so caught up in what our self is supposed to do in this, it doesn't even occur to us to think about not our self. It seems to me that in reading these stories, we have been trained to read them so much in terms of what do I need to do or how do I need to act or what does God want from me that maybe we're missing something. Obviously, these are important things to think about. I mean, just look at James' letter and all the other letters in the Bible that are all about um, guiding Christian communities through these very questions. But this story in Mark's gospel isn't telling us about ourselves at all. It's, it's about Jesus, the Son of Man, the human one. And there's a word play that we kind of miss in, in the NRSV translation today. Jesus says, the human one will be handed over to human hands. That word appears twice. I think that's intentional. The human one will be handed over into human hands and they will kill him. I wonder if this is a story about how our constant focus on ourselves and what we need to do to be closer to God is actually leaving us empty. Maybe that focus on self is killing us, like we killed Jesus. Maybe that's kind of what we do. And maybe the story about Jesus is trying to point out that Jesus doesn't play that game. That this son of man, this human one, is the one who finally kind of escapes that cycle by not focusing on himself all the time. Now, Jesus, in addition to identifying himself as the human one, also identifies himself with this child. It bears remembering that the understanding of childhood in this story is much different from ours, right? In this society, children were loved, but they weren't really appreciated or respected. It wasn't worth a person's time to welcome a child or show them hospitality because they couldn't reciprocate. They couldn't show you hospitality in return. You'd never bother trying to impress a child because that's not going to get you anywhere in life. So I'm wondering, what does it mean for Jesus to identify himself like this? Are we to understand that welcoming Jesus doesn't actually get us anything? Not even salvation? There's a thought. Or perhaps by identifying himself both with the child and with all of humanity, maybe Jesus is trying to help us understand something about ourselves and who we are by showing us who he is. The disciples have just been arguing about who's the greatest. In other words, who has the most to commend themselves? Maybe Peter is the bravest or John is the smartest. Maybe it's Judas who's the best with money in accounting, or Thomas, who's the shrewdest, or maybe, maybe it's good old Bartholomew, who's the greatest because he always does what he's told and never makes waves. No matter what, the whole argument is about what each of these people has 
or does or is that makes them good, makes them great. But the child has none of that. The child depends upon their parents for everything, food, clothing, shelter, education, affection, purpose, even identity. Everything that child has has been given them by someone else. They can't claim to be great in their own right by anything they've done or said or been. What if even Jesus, the Son of God, sees himself like this child, recognizes that even he is not great? Because nothing that is his is actually his. He's been given everything. Maybe the image of God as a parent is less about God as the authority figure at the top of the ladder and more about God as the giver of all things, the one from whom we derive everything that we ever claim is our own. Wealth and intellect, skill, bravery, even obedience. What if Jesus, by pointing to this child, is trying to show us who we are? Thomas Merton writes, At the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes our lives, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is, so to speak, God's name written in us as our poverty, as our indigence, as our dependence, as our belonging. The argument of all the disciples is all about what they have what they do, who they are, all the things that they have to offer the world. <clears throat> That's where they see God in themselves. But according to Merton, and I think to Jesus, the place where God dwells in us is not in what we have, but rather in what we don't have. That if we want to see God in ourselves, the place to look is that place where we recognize that we have nothing that we are nothing, that there is nothing we can do. God is present in our absolute poverty, in our utter dependence upon God and one another. It seems to me that if that's true, that this is the ultimate irony, not that we should want to know who's the greatest, but that we could think that greatest is a thing that exists when there is no greatness that belongs to anyone to begin with. So this is my wondering as I read this story. If God is not to be sought at the top or at the bottom of the hierarchies in which we find ourselves, where is God to be sought? Where can we look to find God? Where will we see God if not in the greatness of great people or in the humility of humble people? If we wish to be closer to God, but cannot do so by climbing up or down than what is left to us. Maybe it's simply in the state of not knowing where God is most present. 